there with Sarah. Recording in progress. Up there. And that will be there every Sunday morning uh, for uh, families to use. So, young people, last week here in church, we were looking at the moment where Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. And he was celebrating a religious feast called Passover with his closest friends. And he knew his time on earth was coming to a close. He knew that at some point in the future, he was going to experience a brutal, a brutal humiliating death. He knew he'd be betrayed by one of his friends. And looking around the room at his closest friends, the Bible tells us that he loved them. He chooses to kneel and wash their feet in turn. And soon after, you probably know the story, Judas disappears to betray Jesus. And then we're told in John 13 that Jesus turns to the remaining disciples and he says this, The time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. And God is going to be glorified because of the Son of Man. And since God received glory because of the Son, God is going to give his own glory to the Son. He's going to do so at once. He says, dear children, any children in the room? I will be, only be with you a little while longer. You'll search for me, but you can't come where I'm going yet. So now I give you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. If you're not sure where to start on your Christian journey today, well, there's a good starting point. By loving the people that you share your home with, loving the people you go to school with, loving extended family, friends, wherever. It's a remarkable commandment that Jesus gives them. It's not a suggestion, by the way. It's not just a random thought. It's a very intentional commandment. Love each other. Serve each other. Watch each other's feet. Watch, not watch. Allow your weaknesses to be the access point of grace. In the midst of this moment, there's a little phrase that Jesus uses to describe himself that we're going to settle on today. And it's this phrase, the Son of Man. And I thought for you guys reading your Gospels, as I'm sure you are at home, you might find that phrase and think, well, gosh, what does that mean? What does it mean that Jesus calls himself the Son of Man? Do you know in Mark's Gospel alone, he does it 13 times. It's the title he uses to describe himself more than any other. He's referred to as the Son of Man in the New Testament, get this, 88 times. So it must matter. Because I can't think of anything else in the New Testament that gets repeated 88 times. Interesting thought. But why? There are multiple layers to this. At first glance, it's an expression of Jesus being a man, which he was. There are lots of labels for Jesus, like Son of God, Messiah, Christ, and they all seem to talk about him being divine, godlike. Son of man seems to focus on him being a person, with flesh and bones and muscles. And actually, there's a prophet in the Old Testament called Ezekiel. And when God talks to him, he calls him son of man a lot. And in that setting, he is talking about Ezekiel just being a man. But there is something more going on with Jesus. Because Ezekiel may have been a son of man, but Jesus was the son of man. Difference. Actually, when Jesus uses the term, he's quoting directly from an Old Testament prophet called Daniel, and it's in Daniel 7, and they're in really difficult circumstances at this point. I won't go into all the detail, but it's a tricky time, 
and they're looking for rescue. They're looking for God to do something to change the situation. And Daniel has this moment where God reveals something to him. He says, I looked, thrones were put in place, and the ancient of days took his seat. Ancient of days is God. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. Wheels on a throne sounds more like a wheelchair. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were serving at the throne of the Ancient of Days. 10,000 times, 10,000 stood in front of him. This is like the throne room of a king with 10,000 multiplied by 10,000 people all gathering there in excitement at the throne of the ancient days. And no wonder they're excited because there's fire everywhere and streams of living water flowing out. It's amazing. Better than a Marvel movie. Better than those incredible scenes that you might see in a film. Fire and water and holiness and splendor and thousands upon thousands standing before the throne. Let your imagination run wild with that. And then it says, Daniel says, I looked and there before me was a son of man. Bingo moment. This is what Jesus was referring to. There before me was a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. That's like a so full of glory that it's like a thick cloud. It's almost like he's riding on it, like he's surfing on it. So you've got this, this, this son of man figure just being carried by a thick cloud of glory into the throne room of the king. This is truly epic. And he approached the ancient of days. The son of man comes before the throne. And the ancient of days gives him authority and glory and power. And all nations and all peoples of every language worshipped the son of man. And it uses a word called dominion, which is like a kingdom, the space that he rules. It says his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which means it goes on and on and on and on and on and just doesn't stop. It won't pass away and his kingdom will never be destroyed. What an incredible description of the Son of Man coming before the ancient of days. In his throne, which is full of fire and water and streams. Man, this is incredible. This is what Jesus is talking about when he calls himself the Son of Man. Anybody at school ever says to you, when does Jesus say that he's God? When does Jesus say he's the Son of God? You can say in Mark's gospel, 13 times, Jesus calls himself son of man. And they'll go, oh? And you can say, Daniel 7, my friend, the ancient of days welcomes the son of man who's riding on the glory of God. It is so divine, it should blow our mind. Now, I need a couple of volunteers some people that might be willing to come up and take a punt. Now, it's a word game, so you probably need to be about seven or above because you need to know some words. But anybody fancy it? We've got a little collection of three at the back. Can, I, can we come up, all three of you? That would be great. Um, we probably need maybe one or two others. Yeah, come on. Um, so just, uh, yeah, come up here with me. Um, Anybody else that you want to invite up to come and make your team with you? Or should we even it up? Could you come over behind? Now, if you stay there, 
And you, you two are teams. You are now against each other. Look at each other and go, grrr. Evelyn, you're just the nicest child I've ever met because you, you look unable to go grrr. So I feel like I need to coach you in this a little bit. Get, get your little tiger paws out and go grrr. And I want you to go. That's him, right? <laughs> there we go. We can see you, right? Okay. So you guys probably won't remember this game, but it's a game called Mallet's Mallet. Did you ever play it? See, all the adults in the room are going, yeah, we remember that. So there's this guy called Timmy Mallet who was completely wacky. Um, and have you ever played it at school? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's like a word association game. So I might say to you, grat, and you'd say... Gordon, what were you going to say? Green. There we go. And then we see, if it was your turn at that point, you would have gone, uh, and we'd have gone, boing. <laughs> yeah, I know. Even when she's been hit over the head, she still looks nice. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay. So I, and, and it flits across, okay? So um, if I said cricket, what would you say? Football. And then you'd go net. There we go. So we're going to do it as teams so you can help each other out, okay? So don't say um... Okay, because if you say um, you get boff. <laughs> All right? Um, so if you're not sure, just hold your word and we'll give you a bit of leeway. Okay, so we'll do a couple of practice rounds. Okay, um, so we'll go for computer. Oh, I see what you did there. I really like that. Well done. <laughs> Say again. Yeah. She's done well there. No, she said hear, as in she's moved it from ear to hearing. Smell. Oh. <laughs> They're mean, aren't they? They called you out there, haven't they? So both of you are bonked. <laughs> so that was a practice round. We're, we're we're now going to go for the real McCoy, okay? And we're going to keep score, and whoever wins gets to go and help themselves to a biscuit at the back. Sorry, Babs. I didn't think of any other prizes. So. <laughs> gets the balloon and a biscuit at the back. I mean, we're layering up the prizes now, aren't we? Okay? So you guys won, so we'll go with you first. You have to be careful with this one, all right? Because I'll be offended if you do this badly. Church. <laughs> nice work. Pastor. <laughs> oh, oh, this has suddenly got really vulnerable. <laughs> if this was my kids, I'd be in so much trouble right now. But you're going to be politer than my kids would be. So we're not going to go bald, short, or anything else rude, all right? <laughs> Dave. Hey! You're my favorite. Clever. Glasses. He's still describing me? I don't know. <laughs> denim. Where did his moustache link to denim? Oh, I see where you were going because you were still describing me. But you have to link it to the word. So I'm going to bonk you, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. There we go. Right. I'm going to come over to you guys first. All right? Hopefully at some point this starts to link to the passage. If it doesn't, just roll with it. All right? <laughs> okay. King. Yeah, you said royal, she said, yeah, jewels, great. Buckingham Palace. Westminster Abbey, I like that. Well educated, Westminster Abbey. Crown, ooh. Now, technically, it's a repetition of crown and crown jewels, so I'm not going to give it to you, I'm afraid, because I'm a meanie. You guys are being super brave. Anne is, like, furious on your behalf, but I'm going to bonk you anyway. So there we go. So last one, okay, over here, um, so far you guys are winning. We're going to go servant. Dave. Yeah, woman, yeah. 
ruler, as in having a ruler over the slave. There's definitely an arm there. Say again? Okay, I'm going to let you have it. Go on. Ross. Oh, wow. That was your mum there calling you out. <laughs> but your mum said, now, you guys are the winner. You get the balloon. But you can all go and grab a biscuit. Give them a big round of applause. So you guys possibly picked up on the um, servant and king. So Jesus tells his disciples they're going to see the Son of Man with great power and glory, which sounds all exciting and powerful. And we're going to think about being kings. And uh, kids, if you want to go and make yourselves a crown, there's some crafty stuff at the back and there's some pictures but hold on to it make sure you write your name on it because we're going to use them as part of our worship at the end so pictures and crowns being made at the back Jesus draws on the language of Daniel 7 to identify himself he explains his identity the son of man is not your average Joe it's a title of deity a supreme example, fullness of deity lived in bodily form. A king so regal, he has the marks of the divine presented to the ancients of days, distinct from the ancients of days, theologians among you. He receives what can only be given to the divine, dominion and glory. He's distinct from God, but he is welcomed by God as the Son of God. And his dominion is everlasting, shall not pass away. No human is eternal. And we're told elsewhere that the Son of Man is able to forgive sin. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The Son of Man came to save lives, rise from the dead, and execute judgment. At his trial before the religious rulers, Jesus said, I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus is identifying himself with the Daniel 7 description. And the Jews knew he was because they then accused him of blasphemy. And that ended the trial. And he was condemned. They knew exactly what he was saying. This, Jesus is identifying himself with the divine king that the Jews have been waiting for for generations. The Jews believed that the Messiah would end tyranny. No more Roman oppression. No more forced pagan sacrifices. Israel will suddenly regain its place as God's chosen nation. The people of the world would stream to it. The disciples, they were convinced that Jesus was the coming king, but they still had not grasped what kind of king he would be. Which is why Peter refused to let Jesus wash his feet. Kings don't wash feet. They don't wash the feet of their followers. But Jesus knew he would be received. He would not be received by the Bible scholars. And that the Romans would make him suffer. That he'd take the way of the criminal. The disciples, they see the lion, but they don't see the lamb. They see the son of man prophesied in Daniel, but not the route that he would take to achieve his everlasting throne. They don't yet see that he's going to go through the cross to reach the highest mountain. He'd go through the deepest valley. Now it's a wonder they don't see it because Jesus explicitly tells his disciples again and again that he will suffer. But so blinkered are they, 
by this description of a rescuing Messiah that they can't hear what he's saying. Jesus combines kingship and servanthood. Each time the disciples don't understand and each time they try and correct Jesus, because that's not the Messiah they were expecting. With Jesus, he's having to deconstruct and then rebuild their understanding of what the Messiah would be. So each time, in, you know, when you read the Gospels in the early chapters and he heals someone and he tells them, don't go and tell anyone, it's because he needs to do this journey of reconstructing the perception of what the Messiah will be, king and servant. This is the Son of God, eternal in nature, the image of the invisible God, the exact representation of the radiance of God, but he has left heaven's glory and taken on this human flesh, becoming the Son of Man that was born in a manger, despised and rejected by mankind. We Kids, you want to take the bit about Jesus being born in a manger and the humility and the brokenness of all of that. And that helps you understand the kind of king that Jesus is. Because we're doing half hour chunks on a Sunday morning, we often do this bit of the story and then this bit of the story and then this bit of the story. But you've, in your head, got to put the whole thing together. But this is the son of man who had no place to lay his head who suffered at the hands of men, who intentionally lowered himself in status. There's not a competition between his kingship and his servanthood. It's through the suffering that Jesus seals his status as the heavenly man, as the heavenly son of God, receiving all glory from the Father, and ruling forever. See, the, the Old Testament has all these incredible prophecies flying around in it. And in some places, it talks about a coming triumphant king. And in other places, it talks about a coming suffering servant. And they might look like total opposites. But in Jesus, we realize they're actually the same person. The disciples wanted a Messiah that was going to liberate them. Take them free from the Romans pagan overlords would reestablish their reputation. But Jesus came to liberate them from a greater captivity. He came to liberate from sin, from themselves, not from the overlord of Rome, but from the overlord of sin. Total liberation required a Messiah who would himself be bound like a criminal so that his followers could be liberated in the only sense that ultimately matters. Jesus the king would suffer as a common criminal servant. Magnificent would be turned inside out. Jesus said to his disciples, I've given you an example to follow. Love one another, just as I have loved you. In Mark 8, Jesus pulls the crowd in. He says, come and listen. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. If you want to save your life, you'll lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Jesus is saying there's a model, there's an example that I need you to follow. The challenge is we love being Christians. We love following Jesus. We love the gospel. It is good news. But if I was to stand here and say it will be sunshine and roses for the rest of your life, I would not be serving you well. Because Jesus is very clear that the call to follow him requires us to pick up a cross like he did and follow him. And he's not saying 
allow yourself to be denied by somebody else. He's not saying be ready to have a cross placed upon you. He's not saying wander about aimlessly. Actually, he calls us to do it to ourselves. Not passive, not waiting, but actually proactively choosing to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. Follow his example. Do what he did. So to be a Christian, you absolutely have to understand who Jesus is because actually without him in the picture, it makes no sense at all. Because if I just stood here and said, hey guys, loss is gain and death is life and yielding guarantees you get everything and self-denial for the sake of the gospel is, is the secret to saving your life, it makes no sense if it's just coming from me. And this is why Christians live a different culture to those who aren't Christian. Because it only makes sense if you're following the example of the rabbi. It only makes sense if you're following the example of the teacher. It only makes sense if you've seen him wash the feet of the disciples first. It only makes sense if you've seen the king become the suffering servant first. If you haven't seen that, it makes no sense at all. Because giving up stuff in order to get stuff isn't how it normally works. And I want to say to you, giving up stuff for the sake of following Jesus is the safest investment that you can make. It is the wisest choice you can make because we are following the example of the rabbi. And just as he died and was rose again, if we take up our cross and follow him, we have a secure promise that we too will spend eternity in the throne room of the ancients of days. That is an astounding promise. So Nick, Nick mentioned that next week we're going to be uh, appointing elders. It's a funny old deal, because normally you apply for a job, there's a salary and there's some pension and there's some benefits and there's some maybe even some prestige in the workplace. But actually the call to Christian leaders is not that. The call for Christian leaders is to be captivated by the image of Jesus and to mimic his self-denying behaviors, and to take up their cross and to follow the way of Jesus to the point of sacrifice. I was talking to Hans yesterday, and he equated it to the role of, of a young parent. Young parents are delighted to have this super precious little adorable baby, but the immediate path ahead is one of sleepless nights and dirty nappies. Young parents lay their lives down. In some way, borrowing Hans's words, in some way they are in charge. In some way they have authority. But the outworking of that authority is to be up at night when the child needs it. Is to change the dirty nappies when the child needs them. That is the expression of Jesus' authority in the local church. It's an immense privilege and it comes with a measure of spiritual authority. But in some way, our culture has polluted our view of Christian leadership by making it a hierarchy. That you get promoted from this role to this role to this role to this role. And we can be nervous of it because we've seen oppressive hierarchies and we've seen abuses of power and we've seen flawed leaders who've fallen from grace. And if we're not careful, we're tempted to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Tempted to say, I don't need authority over my life. I don't need that. The Bible says that leadership is a noble thing. And that teachers will be judged by a higher standard. Many of you will have heard of a guy called Simon Sinek. He wrote a book called uh, Leaders Eat Last. Um, the origins of that are 
that uh, he asked a, a general in the U.S. Marines, what makes the Marines so great? And his response was fascinating because this General Flynn, he didn't reference their training, tactics, or weapons. He said, leaders eat last. And it became the title of Simon Sinek's book in 2014. This symbolic gesture is such a clear cultural statement. When the soldiers come for their lunch or their dinner, the junior soldiers line up first. And if there's food left at the end, then the leaders eat. So next says that real leaders are mothers who lay themselves over their child in a war zone to protect them from harm. It says you can easily judge the character of a person by how they treat those who can do nothing for them. The true price of leadership being the willingness to place the needs of others above your own. That great leaders truly care about those they are privileged to lead and understand that the true cost of the leadership privilege comes at the expense of self-interest. It's like he's been reading Jesus, right? He has a, a faith background in his family hierarchy. I'm not sure it's particularly Christian. But actually, there's a challenge for you in his book as well, because it says this. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. doesn't matter how old you are. doesn't matter your background or your heritage. doesn't matter your wealth, your status, your rank, your title. We're all able to listen, to ask questions, and to encourage others in ways that cause them to dream more, learn more, and do more. Because leaders don't squash, they facilitate the growth and potential of their people. Just a few other helpful quotes for you. John Maxwell said that leadership isn't about titles, positions, or flow charts. It's about one life influencing another. Jim Collins wrote a book called Good to Great, sold over two and a half million hard copies, translated into 32 languages, great business thinker. Fascinating quote here. He says, the difference between a good leader and a great leader is, I'd love to have given you all a post-it note and asked you to write down and see what it is. Does anybody know the quote? The difference between a good leader and a great leader is humility. Oh, it's like he's been reading Jesus. Big business previously wouldn't have used that word. It's like there's been a whole sea change in business culture, recognizing that weakness and humility are part of our leadership journey. There's another book that's called Why Anyone Should Be Led by You by a guy called Robert Goffey and Gareth Jones. Why Anyone Should Be Led by You. Next time we do a leadership conference, just stick that up on the slide and watch them all go quiet. Fascinating. He says, when leaders reveal their weaknesses, they show us who they are, warts and all. Exposing a weakness establishes trust and thus helps folks get on board. If executives try to communicate that they're perfect at everything, there'll be no need for anyone to help them with anything. They won't need followers. They'll signal that they can do it all themselves. Now, none of this is the Bible. And you might be thinking, well, why is he including this in a sermon? Well, I just think it's interesting that secular wisdom is catching up with the example of Jesus. Jesus, who was the Son of Man, the King, who made himself obedient to death, even death on a cross, then found himself exalted to the highest place by the Father. Now, folks, our experience as a church shouldn't be like a musical performance. If you go to the theater, what you, what you see is, is the end product of months of rehearsal and performance. But actually, this would be more like the dress rehearsal. 
because it's going to be a little bit shabby around the edges and some of the props will be in the wrong place and there'll be some lines that get forgotten. But actually, Christian life is one of grace and our weakness and forgiveness for our mistakes and restoration when we fall. So the example that you'll see in us is how you carry on in your discipleship journey with weakness and humility. That in our weakness, you'll recognize his grace. And in our mistakes, you'll recognize his forgiveness. And when we fall, you'll recognize the grip of his grace as he lovingly restores us. The church will walk the path of discipleship together. And you have to understand who Jesus is for it to make any sense. Because without understanding who Jesus is, the whole thing is just completely upside down. And without Jesus, it isn't worth it. Because if Jesus isn't the resurrected Savior, if he isn't the Son of Man who's presented to the ancient of days in the throne room of grace, we are to be pitied above all people. But hey, if he is the Son of Man, if he is the Son of Man, who being in very nature God, became obedient to death and was presented before the throne room of God. If he is the Son of Man who comes with clouds of glory in heaven, if he is the Son of Man who approaches the throne of the ancients of days with ten times, ten times, thousands of people, if he has been given all authority, glory, and sovereign power, if he does have dominion that is everlasting, that will not pass away, then he's worthy of my whole life. And isn't he awesome? We're going to sing in a moment. And the calling in this moment is not to sing songs, but to offer your life as a living sacrifice to him. Johan, if I could have the slide. The calling in this moment is to give up everything we have, all our greatest treasures, to lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. And it will appear in a moment, and like a magic. Kids, you've been making crowns, and I'm hoping you've written your name in them, because I want you, what I want you to do is to come and lay them at the feet of Jesus. It's your act of worship moment. If you could just flick on through for me. There it is. Feet of Jesus. We can literally come to this place. There's a good worship band over there. You won't be able to get over that side. Come to this place with your crown and lay it at the feet of Jesus. If you haven't written your name in it, do it before you lay it because I don't want tears as we go home because you can't find yours. We want you to be able to take yours home with you. This is your act of worship moment. Adults, if you've not had a chance to make one, there are some still at the back. Some of you might think, wow, this really speaks to my creative language. Hey, Babs is off. <laughs> Dave, you want to come on back? Lord Jesus, we recognize who you are. And as we follow the rabbi... We commit ourselves to be disciples of the Son of Man. To go through the pathway of sacrifice. To know the richness of the resurrected Jesus. And so we come in our worship to lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. So if you'd like to stand. So kids, if you weren't listening then before, just listen now. This song is a moment for you to worship and come and lay your crown as we sing. Obviously, you can have your crown back again. <laughs> and adults, do whatever you need to do to respond to Jesus.
do a song that we've probably not done for a long time. The Servant King. Uh, it just, just uh, talks a lot about what goes with business. Worship to the 
comes to his hands and his feet. The stars that speak of sacrifice, hands that pluck stars into space. To cruelness surrender. This is our servant king he calls us now to follow him to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant So let us learn how to serve and in our lives in calling each other's needs to prefer. For it is Christ we're serving. This is our God. Servant King, He calls us now to follow Him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the Servant King. This is our God, the Servant King. He calls us now to follow Him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the Servant Faith can move the mountains, let the mountains move. We come with expectations, waiting here for you. Waiting here for you. You're the Lord of all creation, and still you know my heart. The author of salvation, you've loved us from the start. Waiting here for you, with our hands, with our Praise and it's 
desperate for your presence. All we need is you. We're waiting here for you with our hands lifted. Singing hallelujah, we're singing hallelujah, we're singing hallelujah, Waiting here for you with our hands lifted high in praise, and it's you we adore. We sing. Singing hallelujah, singing hallelujah, singing hallelujah. 
It's been a great uh, morning this morning, worshipping the servant king, the one who gave his life for us. Let's uh, enjoy our tea and coffee together, and hopefully we'll see everyone at the weekend. If you haven't yet booked in, book in today. Don't miss out. It's going to be a brilliant weekend together. Cloverly Hall. God bless you. Thanks for coming. Take me deeper.